We'd like to uh, welcome Thomas Tu, uh, AMD fellow, focusing on system memory platform architecture development. Uh, he started at Xilinx, which was acquired by AMD. And prior to uh, Xilinx, it was also with NVIDIA, uh, working on a lot of advanced memory and high-speed circuits over his career. And with that, uh, we welcome Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Ara, for the introduction. So, yeah, thank you and good morning or good evening for uh, to, uh, well, wherever you are at this moment. So, um, for today, I want to share some of um, our method or our experience on how to systematically identify the key design factors for chiplet integrations. Now, before I dive into the methodologies on how to identify the key design factors, I will provide a um, background focusing on the ASIC development cost and also the ROI trends. And of course, we're focusing on the chiplet integrations as a solutions. It is a solutions. It is also have some challenges. For this particular discussions today, I'll be focusing on the electrical performance. Simply put, how to make this link fast and how to manage that and how, to we, how do we identify the key factors. I'll turn into the next sessions, I refer to as the chiplet connections. As I mentioned earlier, what are the design factors to make this link go fast? There's a reason that why we want to go fast, I'll explain it in a minute. And also we want to determine these factors such that we can internally develop the system holistically, much more robust, much more efficiently. And also with this particular approach, we can help us to identify the key factors as we go to our external consortiums and help the ecosystem, what are the key factors that we want to specify? We'll turn into the design factors uh, sensitivity analysis. The, the basis to form this design sensitivity analysis are referred to as the unified system jitter model. And we'll use this particular model to perturb with different underlying design factors and will help us to study the gradient of descent. We we'll use this particular methods also to present a case study. Many times that we need to understand if we change a couple of things, let's say we're going to go into internal development, we change the, let's say in this particular case, is the interconnect media, how much impact to the whole system performance in terms of speed. Mm -hmm. There, of course, there are many aspects to, to consider, but for this particular discussions, I'll be focusing on how to make that fast. And I'll follow up with the uh, summary and also the conclusions. But let's look at the backgrounds. So, so this particular graph shows the ASIC development cost and also the return of investment comparisons. On the left-hand side, you can see and plot, I plot out the amount of, in terms of dollar uh, to develop for the development across different processing nodes. And also each, in each of these processing nodes, I highlighted that as subdivisions of the development activities, such as defining the architectures, you need to validate the design, and also you need to have the software support and also the physical design. Each subcategory is identified in, within this um, uh, process looks, indicating the relative cost. But one thing for certain, and also the key takeaway is that the cost of the monolithic IC integrations is skyrocketed. And particularly, you can see the trend going up. In order to sustain this kind of activities for the monolithic integrations, we need to evaluate the ROI, the return of investment, which is indicating on the right-hand side and plot it with the dark uh, solid line over here. It turns out that the ROI of monolithic integrations becomes unattainable just to maintain the return of this investment. Also, when you look at these days applications, it is more than uh, just like a, a, a computing is more than just CPU. There are many um, developments such as the, um, the, the edge sensing or the machine learnings, hardware machine learnings. The application is so diverse, but when we try to integrate all these features of interest, into one IC and one particular processing nodes, they are becomes very compli complicated and also very costly. And also uh, or, uh, arguably integrating all these like, uh, like analog features or optic features onto advanced processing logic nodes is not uh, very uh, cost effective. So chiplet implementation becomes um, uh, solutions. As examples over here, um, this particular example is integrating different uh, uh, logic regions and connecting that with, a interpose, with an interposer. As people, we refer to as a 2.5D uh, uh, integrations. 
but chiplet implementation as a whole uses a selection of modular dies called we refer to as chiplets. And these chiplets may have different functions, as I mentioned earlier or touched upon earlier, and they can be developed uh, by different process or different uh, uh, company as well. By mixing and matching these chiplets, we can offer a better combination of features and provide a better performance uh, needs to satisfy the, um, the, the market trend. Come look at the chiplet integration timelines for a moment. So in fact, chiplet integration in general is not that new concept by itself. Back to like, day back to like 1980s, we already saw um, MCM, multiple chipped modules integrations. A couple of years down the road, we saw the system in package. And then further down, uh, we just started similar to the examples that I listed, the 2.5D integrations technique via uh, Interposa. And we saw like different like uh, embedded bridge in terms of media and how do we integrate it. And also we are arguably one successful, uh, one very successful integration is the HBM, high memory, high bandwidth memory inter uh, uh, interface or system. There they use a chip on wafer integrations. And in presently, we are looking at heterogeneous integrations. So once again, when we look back this timeline for a moment, uh, we realize that chip to chip integration has been continuously evolving and accelerating in terms of their revolutions, in terms of media of choice, the, the complexity of the feature as well. This actually creates a more development challenges from many angles, from many different uh, aspects. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, it will be it will definitely third party design is going to be involved. It's no longer vertical development. And how do we? Our job is how do we integrate the system completely, uh, uh, holistically and successfully? And that is our focus. If you go one step further, we will ask ourselves, how do we identify and quantify the key design factors? Of course, there'll be very varies from system to system. So once again, look at the chiplet connections now. These pictures depict um, chiplet connections. So again, uh, we have two or maybe three chiplets in this particular pictures. The compute die sitting on the south side, and then we have two chiplets. Intuitively, you can see that we insert a chiplet along the path of the compute die and the data, or maybe like a data referring like either from a camera, from an optical sensor, or from other uh, uh, other uh, 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 chiplet. You in, we insert a, in the, uh, a third party agent in between. We do not want them to be slow. We want to create a link such that it can create a lowest possible latency and provide the highest throughput. But regardless of that, we need to make it fast. And also, as I mentioned earlier, these chiplets will be developed by one or multiple companies and that complicates the matter. Uh, optimizing the system integrations requires, once again, identifying the crucial designing factors. Because we're talking about speed, so I'm gonna be a little spoiler right here, is that we'll be sharing a method called Unified chip interconnect jitter analysis model. We're looking at a jitter. Well, the jitter or system jitter uh, in general, uh, starting from the transmit side through the media to the receive side. We want to use the system jitter as a figure of merits. And underneath this system uh, jitter, there will be many underlying factors, such as power noise, power noise tone, the powers of power amount, and how do we design or maybe balance, call it, um, the interface uh, in this particular uh, uh, transmit system. And that will be the uh, uh, information that I'm gonna share in the next couple of files. The next session I'll refer to as the chiplet connections. So once again, I focus and objective is to identify what are the underlying design factors so that we can uh, optimize the system jitter as a whole. This is a typical chiplet connections, starting from chiplet zero from the left-hand side. So we send signal through the channels. Channels can mean like interposer, info, uh, OS or MS, uh, or also maybe other different media. And then we send the signals towards the receiving end. In this case, chiplet number one. So once again, we want to make sure that well, we want to know how to manage and control the link jitter. The jitter, at this stage, starting from the beginning, let's say the transmit area, will acquire, uh, will integrate and accumulate uh, based on many underlying factors such as power noise. So 
we are going to look into how we divide and also decompose those in our underlying design factors. And we're going to rate them in a minute with our, his, our systematic methods. So starting from the left-hand side, let's say chiplet number one now, it is going to transmit the signal and through the channels. And we want to make sure that the link is fast as possible, lowest latencies. And also at the end of it, uh, we're going to receive the signals uh, uh, solidly to make sure that we have uh, able to manage the, the, the jitter. So the data transmits has a multiple stage as I depicted on the left-hand side, starting from a clocking source, just focusing on the interface file uh, IO. Um, the jitter is going to be induced by um, uh, the power noise and accumulated along the way. And as we go through that, uh, we'll divide the jitter in terms of the power tone and also the amplitudes. So let's look at the design factors, uh, 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 the unified model for a moment. Particularly looking at the power noise. Well, here we show, I'm showing the power noise to jitter transfer characteristic. So what I want to sh share with you is this. Any circuitry, uh, when we launch signals, and there'll be bias or power by power, uh, power rails. And the power rails in a real system, it will have different kind of noise tone. This particular graph shows over here is, in, is the indications of the jitter sensitivity versus different noise tones or noise frequencies. When we look further, a bit of a transistor level, um, you can see that uh, this is actually is a low pass uh, filter characteristic. Uh, a certain frequency, lower frequency, the transfer characteristic is relatively constant. But as we go further in terms of the noise, right, noise uh, amplitude or frequencies, and they'll start to attenuate. And that's natural because um, there's a certain response uh, inertia of the interface or transistors. But more importantly is this, another, and also um, alluded to the next uh, design factors, uh, possible critical design factors, the longer the delay that we design or the interface design uh, for the chiplet interface, the higher the jitter sensitivity and it's depicted by the different color of the graphs over here. The light blue curve graph is showing that if this is a shortest delay and the jitter transfer is relatively lower comparing to the green graphs over here. So of course, our noise tone and frequency matter because we in chiplet interface, even though we're talking about the interfacing with the channels, it does not exist in the isolated world. When we integrate the whole system, there'll be logic behind this interface file. And those are toggling as well. Those noise tone and the amounts of noise tone is related to the power delivery network. Yesterday, a speaker mentioned that to take, tackle these challenges, we must balance the signal integrity as well as the power integrity. This particular area, this particular step is to take the power integrity or power noise in general and translate it into jitter. And then we can translate it into timing and using the system jitter as a figure of merits for optimizations. Just to elaborate the concept further, um, if imagine that we have a long chain of delay path, delay path, just a delay path. Each of these segments of this delay will, will is of course is connected to a power. As the power varies, the relative delay of each stage is going to vary. For example, it's indicating by the red arrows over here, starting from the nominal voltage, as the voltage drops, the delay got increased naturally. And then as the voltage drops further, the delay got further pushed out by this and stage by stage. And this will be also accumulated too. So the power noise actually modulates the buffer delay. This particular characteristic is the foundation building concept of the unified jitter model. So stage by stage, and also we add this stage together. So we can use um, uh, behavior representations, such as the one that I shows over here, to mimic and model the power supply noise. Later on, we'll elaborate the power supply noise is not, not only a constant, it will involve like the power tone as well as the amplitude. Starting from the first stage of the buffer, the power is first induced by the power, uh, by the power rail noise. And then stage by stage, we're gonna add up this amount of push out and accumulate it um, uh, to, the exit, to the exit of the transmitter's uh, side before we enter the, the, the channels. We're using this particular way to model that. And then we can also perturb using different kind of power tone and interlying um, design factors. And that help us to form a set of uh, 
uh, uh, uh, evaluation data. And from there, we can use that to study the sensitivity. So now let's walk with me. Now we're just exiting the, uh, the transmitter. Let's say the chiplet number one, right at the boundary. So and um, now we're gonna enter the channels. The channels can be a choice of media or, or, or design factors and the routability considerations. But gen the, in the general sense, the channel will experience attenuations. So swing over here is a concept of the transfer function of the loss channels characteristic. It will actually reduce and actually attenuate over the frequencies naturally. But in terms of the jitter, remember we're using the jitter as a figure of merits. So the jitter is now exiting the transmitter side and start entering the channels. Imagine that the channel is a runway and your car is actually entering that particular uh, runway. Um, the jitter itself, when we pass, when it passes through the, uh, the lossy channels, it will amplify. And this is the behavior we call it jitter amplifications. Plotting over here is a study by choosing a two different media, um, namely um, a particular interposer, the channel that we selected, and compare to an info uh, media that we selected to, uh, to implement and study. And this will form yet another input design factors, right? So looking at the jitter amplifications help us to unify and comprehend the jitter stage by stage. And we're walk walking through the jitter through the channels now and eventually at the receiving end. The receiving end models is similar to what we model in the transmit side. So now we are ready to put and combine the whole unifying jitter model. Once again, jitter model is the basis. So as illustrated over here, once again, the chiplet zero is now transmitting signal from the transmitter through the channels. You can choose the channel either interposer or info, and then you go to the receiver. And the concept is we combine them together. So once we have that, let's do a quick demo over here and now click the, uh, the run button. So plotting over here on the right-hand side, the yellow bar represents the peak-to-peak -peak jitter. And the horizontal time scale is the runtime of this system. Now, because we're using the unified, uh, unified uh, jitter models, the jitter from the TX through the channels and through the receiver are now all combined in one holistic model. And then we can use to play around with different input factors to study what is the amount that we saw when we, let's say, move the certain tone to, uh, let's say, 2x, right? So to, to, to exaggerate the effects. But one by one, we can use this to form what we refer to as the response surface and to study the input factors. And that's the high, le uh, high level general concept of using this um, uh, unified model to enable us to do the next steps, which is the surface studies. All right, so, but before we do that, uh, model is model, right? Model is never real. Model after all is a model. We need to do correlations and do a checkpoint. Um, just to illustrate that um, what we did over here before was uh, we took a system that has the, uh, in fact, this is a, a HBM system. So the system that we are, we are using is to look at the system jitter measurement with different traffic excitations. So once again, we have the basis. So we excite the different traffic. Well, this is real life applications. So by exciting the different traffic, we can see different kind of noise tone on that. This system allow us to directly measure the noise of a particular rail and over the spectrum, the top one over here is the power spectrum measurement and also a time domain measurement as well. And together simultaneously, we look at the measured jitter. We pick a selected signal to measure that. The method here is that once we have the uh, understanding of the amount, we use it we use this unified jitter model to predict what kind of jitter that we will see. And the result summarized over here. With the right tuning of the right tone and also the frequency, uh, uh, frequency position, that's frequency position representing the edges, right? Of the noise versus the transition edge of the data. Uh, it shows a reasonably match in terms of the noise, uh, the noise amount as well as the, uh, the predicted uh, jitter with this unified model. So that, establish a confidence level of the basis. So now we are ready to take on the integration journey. <clears throat> so let's work with me on this one. Imagine that we are now starting to do the integrations. Now we could have like a multiple um, different vendors from different companies to integrate it in the system. <clears throat> um, and our job is to guarantee our target performance but there will be a lot of underlying factors, right? 
the choice of interconnect media. Either we choose an expensive interposer or much more reasonable media. That's a choice, but the choice is dictated by are we meeting the system performance as a whole? We need to identify the critical factors for optimizations. So listed on the table over here is a set of um, uh, 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 design factors, or maybe the factors that would impact the particular uh, channels, channel speed or jitters, namely um, the frequency noise amplitude of the transmit clocks. And there will be multiple frequency tone and also the different amplitude. And also the receiver side, what are the noise tone that we expect on the receiver power, receiver side power, power noise tone and the characteristic. There's a choice of connecting them together and there's a choice of separating them to, um, a different way. And also the choice of the media, of course, whether we choose, as I alluded earlier, the choice of the, um, the interposer, what is the characteristic, what is the, uh, the jitter amplifications, and also the delay of that um, um, the buffer as well, because the longer the delay, the more easier to acquire jitter along the path. So all these are lumped into a set of tables. I genetically call it X1, X1, sub and X2, sub and X15, right? So, but with that, we can simulate together with the unified model and study the jitter that we just saw, we just show, uh, I just saw over here on the top right-hand side. More importantly, we plot the surface graph. The surface graph is like, it's just like a slope of, the mark of a hillside. The steeper the slope, the more impactful for that selected uh, factors onto our system jitter. And that's a general concept. I will skip the math uh, evaluation, so just to keep it simple. Um, this is a one of the examples that we study. So once again, power noise will have different power tones. And the power tone is not only just the, um, the interface itself. As we integrate and combine it together with the integrate file, um, and then there will be underlying uh, logic blocks behind. So those in the uh, uh, the noise tone of those power uh, domains will be needs to be understood by the system integration designers. And once again, from experience, uh, we can list out a set of the um, uh, the input design factors, namely the uh, the power noise. Once again, the up the amount of the power noise and the frequency uh, location as well. So we ran through this particular one one by one and started to study the effects table which is listed over here. With that, the outcome is to is identify, able to identify the key, well, maybe like top three or top five factors um, so that we can start looking into optimization for those factors. Uh, one comment on that, naturally, well, the, uh, no, no surprise, um, the power noise at the transmit side and the near the interface matter more. Uh, and then the next is that the receiver side. And also the length of that, depending the delay, depending uh, there was a sweet spot. It really depends on the uh, specific system. So those amounts don't take the amount exactly uh, the order too much um, uh, uh, on that, but it's actually capable of showing the relative uh, uh, impact of these underlying factors to our system jitter. So the readout also can be plot in terms of a graphs. Uh, once again, you saw the graphs, 3D graphs that I showed earlier, which is a, a three-dimensional or two factors versus the um, output system jitter. But we can also one by one looking at this, we call uh, the prediction profiler. So once again, each of these in, uh, underlying factors, I just name it for the, uh, for the readability. I just call it one, six, X sub one through X sub 15, and the decoding table is on the right-hand side. The concept is to look at the slope, the gradient. The steeper the slope, the more impactful this particular factors to our figure of merits, once again, which is the system jitter. This particular flow allow us to evaluate in a selected system design, what are the relative importance of these design factors. And with that, we're able to optimize it internally. And also we can use the same concept when we go to like uh, discuss with uh, our uh, the ecosystem or the, cons uh, the specification or st standard uh, consortiums. We can use this information to help us to define the key design factors or the spec for specifications. So le let's look at uh, key stu case studies that uh, when we apply this um, uh, 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 sensitivity analysis. So. And once again, the same system that we had before. And the ask was, well, we have a system that was implemented in um, Interposer. The ask was, what if we want to do that in a, um, like a lower cost uh, interface media, such as uh, Info? What is that impact? Okay, of course, naturally you can do a, a, 
uh, expert estimation as well as like uh, we can do create uh, a lot of like uh, combination um, uh, evaluations. But with this unifying method and also the sensitivity analysis, right off the bat, we look at the channel amplification factor, which is, by the way, listed at X sub 11 over here. And we are now to look at the graphs, look at the uh, prediction profile, and particularly look at the slope. On this, in this particular case, we saw that the channel amplifications, and we swap in the um, interposer by the uh, info, the impact is relatively flat. That gives us immediate confidence that we should be able to uh, interchange this in, uh, uh, interface our media and yet achieve the same system performance. Uh, the snapshot below over here is the actual measurement that we did. Uh, one is implemented in the uh, interposer, the lower one is in the, uh, implemented in the uh, info. <clears throat> Excuse me. So looking at the margins, this is the ice wolf margins, the real life measurement um, that the, uh, the, the delta between that, at least at the cross point of the ref, re ref positions is very similar. So that will help us to do a quick evaluation of the system uh, optimizations. So with that, um, we'll turn into our um, uh, summary and also the conclusion and a couple of the key takeaways. So I want to highlight the key takeaway of that. Um, monolithic systems are on the chip integrations using the um, monolithic IC is very expensive and the ROI is slowing down. So chiplet implementation offers solutions. The new integrations provide a way, a new way to incorporate different features um, to serve better, but it's also created its own new challenges. For heterogeneous integrations, we must understand what are the key design factors, and we must know how to define them systematically. So we illustrated a method we refer to as the unified jitter models, and together with the sensitivity analysis, allow us to identify the key design factors, but it will help both internally development and also the external specifications in the standardized uh, consortiums. We saw the case study, we swap in and swap out the interface uh, uh, media, and with this particular sensitivity analysis, allow us to effectively make that call. So key takeaway is that, for this equalize, uh, the ecosystem enabling, we must identify the key design factors systematically in order to enable a healthy ecosystem. With that, I'm going to stop here and for our Q and A. Yeah, thank you, Ira, and thank you, team. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so, it's, I have a whole bunch of questions, but uh, certainly uh, so I'll see what you know we, we get from the. Uh, audience, but one, one of the background questions was on the, the development costs of different process nodes. Mm -hmm. the, the comment was made, the software seems to be a really large chunk. Is that mm -hmm. the cost of developing software or is that the, you know, just the licensing fee for the software, mm -hmm. if you know? Mm -hmm. I, um, mean, mm -hmm. I don't have the exact number, but in general, both. Mm -hmm. Number one is that for every process that we are um, well, if silicon process I'm talking about, um, the enabling uh, software, of course, um, the, the foundry vendors are going to provide that. And that development, uh, not only the paying the license itself, but the moment, let's say, for example, certain design rules, uh, when it's ready, the development cost is actually needs to add into that. Secondly, is that, for example, place and route. Okay, I'm just going to the silicon side for a moment. Place and route for like, a, I just um, arbitrarily say, let's say uh, you already have like 18 layers of metals. What are the place and route rules? What are the things that actually, um, uh, when uh, EDA licenses, that could be a, 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 some of the new learning, right? So that will be some lead way to enable that software before it's usable, first of all. Don't forget, those development time is money. Time, money, resources of uh, development is money. Right. Makes sense. So um, on, on back to the interfaces themselves, and this is a really fascinating way to look at this very systematically. Um, do you have to do this for every design or is this analysis when you design, let's say, a phi standard? Once you do the analysis, then you just it's done mm -hmm. you know let's say you you pick whichever standard you want to use you do this analysis once you're done mm -hmm. or do you have to redo this analysis every mm -hmm. time because your channel length varies a little mm -hmm. bit mm -hmm. i mean exactly excellent question in fact that is the theme of that the answer to this question is that first of all find out let's say the channel length right for examples right so 
does it matter? Does it matter to our design? So first of all, for let's say company ABC, right? So they will have a mindset of like, what are the targeted, um, I would say boundary, all right? So on this particular system, let's say I want to build, I'm just arbitrarily saying that um, two chiplets doing um, certain things, right? Um, uh, cannot be too specific on that. So you have a framework. Okay, you have a choice of like a um, media. Then there'll be a cost factors, like you choose an interposer or whatever. Now you have a boundary. The second step is that exactly applying this sensitivity analysis. Part of this holistic approach is that not only looking at the electrical, okay, and look, look, not only looking at the maybe a third party IP that we integrated. So let's look at the electrical behavior. Well, of course, we're looking at our speed right now, right? So let's say to answer your question is that, is that significant? Is that a significant factor? Let's say I change the length a little bit. What does it impact? Probably not. Okay, so we have to use that gradient to study. So uh, of course, for different uh, design, I would say framework or platform, I call it, um, that will be a different set of um, uh, evaluations. But once you're evaluating that, and will allow us to identify uh, the uh, uh, relative importance by in terms of numbers, right? You give a ranking number essentially, and that is very um, uh, helpful in a way that I see we see that it's much more effective instead of just a guessing game. Okay, Hope that right. answer your question. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, it lets you parametrically decide, you know, okay, how far can the chiplets be before you break the phi or mm -hmm. things like that. Right. Right. And, and then, so with this, I mean, if, you know, I, I could see there's a few models, but, you know, if it's your own phi or your own development, Let's see, and you're working with partners and everybody implements the same, that's fine. But if you're working with, you know, let's say one of the developing standards and I'm not oh. gonna pick any of them, but do you then have to get the gate level? How much do you need to know about each chiplet to make sure that it's gonna work when you put oh. it together? Uh -huh. I mean, you know, you can't really treat the phi as, I mean, there, it's not like USB where, okay, it's all been compliance tested and you know it should work. Mm -hmm. How much do you need to know about the phi mm -hmm. on the chiplet or mm -hmm. the rest of the chiplet to, to make sure your, uh -huh. your channel is going to be good? Correct. Yeah, I hear you. So definitely we cannot uh, open up uh, the third party IP because of proprietary, no matter how, um, how, um, how close the relationship is. But the key thing is to understand the important uh, behavior. In this particular case, what is the jitter transfer characteristic on your phi. So let's say um, I use the power noise as a dominating factor in most of the parallel bus they are. Uh, the deterministic jitter from the power noise transfer to the, um, to the jitter is matter. So all we need to do is that, well, once we identify certain power rail, let's say it's a 1.5 power volt power rail or point, uh, uh, point 0.8 volt power rail and, and so whatever name they call it. Tell me please, I would uh, play it out like uh, let's define what are the jitter allowance tolerance so that we can combine it together. And then once we add up, you can imagine that this is almost like a, a bookkeeping, right? So Excel spreadsheets, oh, you have X amount of jitter and X, uh, in our environment, um, uh, let's, say, uh, uh, let's say the picosecond per millivolt is like 20, right? So my environment has, let's say a, a 100 millivolt of noise, right? So we can immediately add them up together, together with a choice of our channels. And then I have a budget. I, uh, as a system designer, holistically, I have a budget. So look, well, I am negative, right? Let's see, if we change this, uh, or maybe even swap a different um, uh, IP uh, provider, uh, can we improve it? Or can we change the channel? Can we improve it? At the end of the day, I want to make sure that the balance sheet's balanced in terms of jitter in this case. Right, right. Mm -hmm. right. So for, for a number of the parameters, you can do this without having to, let's say, get their gates mm -hmm. and simulate the whole thing. You can, you, 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 you take the parameters and you, does does the math work? Is does it fit within the budget for that parameter? Exactly. And, uh -huh. and then you have high confidence that it should work. Exactly. And, and anchor that. with the critical design factors. The rest of them, well, can be uh, can be uh, well trade off, right? Anchor the most important players in this game. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Great, Re really fascinating. So thank you very much for sharing this, Thomas. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you. Right. And, and once again, I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors, Adventist and ASC. Uh, Adventist uh, has received the highest ratings and customer satisfaction, the VLSI research survey for the last uh, 
two consecutive years. So congratulations to them. And uh, ASC uh, supporting the chiplet era, which has begun in terms of providing advanced packaging and working with their customers like Leong has discussed to do heterogeneous integration and advanced packaging. So thank you both to Adventist and ASC who've made this webinar possible. I also would like to thank all the presenters and most importantly, thank you for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you.